Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Portico Church. It's good to see you all here. You two boys and girls, it's good to see all of you here. This is your church as well, your church family. Uh, we're glad you all are here. My name is Johnny Reeve, one of the pastors here. It's my joy to welcome you to worship this morning. Uh, go ahead and stand up. We're going to get ready this morning. With our call to worship, as always, and I say this every week, hopefully it doesn't get old, uh, but the reason we do a call to worship is not a reminder of somebody up here on stage saying, hey, you better sing, but it's a reminder of who God made us to be, like we're worshipers. And we lose sight of that often. Uh, we worship the wrong things. We give our hearts to the wrong things. And so this is a chance to reorient your heart and, and place it upon the only thing that's worthy, which is God. So uh, allow this time to prepare you to be in God's presence, to be able to receive from him, to sing to him, to trust him. We're going to read from Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. The words will be up on the screen there for you. So let's read them together. I'll pray, and then we'll sing together. Okay? Here we go. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Pray with me, please. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning that you've given us. We thank you that, uh, God, you're merciful to us. Our hearts are prone to wander away from you, uh, to uh, just to walk away from, from trusting in you, for relying on you, being dependent on you, even forgetting that you're God, even forgetting that you're in control, uh, that every good thing we have comes from you. We thank you that you are merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love towards us. Yeah, we pray this morning that that would be a reason, a motivation deep in our hearts to sing and to uh, glorify you and praise you because of who you are. Not just in part, but completely, God, that you are completely holy, that you are completely worthy of all of our praise, all of our worship, all of our being, God. So we commit this morning to you, God. We pray that it is honoring to you. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Let's sing together. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not them. Without bottom or shore, our sins they are many. His mercy is more. Sing praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy. What 
patience. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is called in us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. He's lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is born. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. His mercy is born. You can take a seat here for a moment. And Chris Cupid is going to lead us in a time of corporate prayer together. Good morning. This morning I'm going to pray with us for patience. Is there anyone in the room that could use more patience right now? We have a very honest church. This is great. Um, if we think about it, how important is patience? Could the world use a little more patience right now? Could Washington, D.C. use more patience right now? We all recognize we need patience. There's a story in the Old Testament about King Saul. He had not been king for very long, and he is facing the Philistines, and he's, he's facing possibly inevitable defeat. And Samuel has told him to wait for seven days, and Samuel will come, and he'll do, he'll do the sacrifice. Saul gets nervous. And probably on the seventh day, with just a few hours before Samuel arrives, Saul conducts the sacrifice, which was prohibited in Israel. The sovereign king was not to, not to do the role of the high priest, or the priest. Saul takes the role of the high priest upon himself, and, and in doing so, it exhibits impatience. And as a result, his kingdom is taken from his hands. So think of all the times in your life where if you had just exhibited a little more patience for just a little bit longer, how much we need it. Now, fortunately, we have a God who's very generous and gives us patience. All we have to do is ask. So let's go to the Lord and ask him for the great gift that he gives us of patience. If you'll pray with me. Father, we come before you and we recognize that we are imperfect. We are sinners and you've saved us by your grace. And one of the things that we lack is patience. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us patience now. We ask that you would bless us with patience in abundance. Help us to be slow to speak and slow to get angry. And, Lord, we ask that we would look to you as the one who gives it, not something that we can muster on our own. It's not innate within us. It's not natural to any of us. But it is natural to you, and you do give good gifts to your children, and we thank you for this. And Lord, so we come to you trusting and asking 
that you will bless us with your good gifts that you promised to give us. And we're thankful that you, you will, this is a prayer that you are very glad to answer. We're grateful that you are patient, patient with us. And help us to remember going forward all the times you've been patient with us, where we have mocked you, where we have um, thwarted your will, where we have sinned to your face, but yet you're still patient with us. Help us in recognizing this to know that we can be patient with others. So we ask that for our church, we ask that for our city, and we ask that, ask that for world leaders as well. We all could use more patience, and we thank you that you're glad to give that to us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Church, let's stand. We'll sing again.
Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We do praise you. That while we were still sinners, you sent your son to die for us. To give us his life, his righteousness, and that he would take our sin. He would set us apart, make us different. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done on our behalf. He set us free, he's rescued us. And we're not enslaved to sin and death, but we are um, set free in Christ. I pray that that would change our hearts, that would change our whole life, and that you would constantly, day by day, renew us and teach us what it means to live in that freedom. Teach us what it means to follow you, Heavenly Father. To surrender our whole life to you as you've made us free to do so. We thank you for this time of worship. We pray that you would teach us now, God. We thank you for your word. Uh, we, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Kiddos, it's your time to shine. Find a blue shirt or just head downstairs to the kids' classrooms. The rest of you can say good morning to one another. Find something maybe you don't know and say good morning. We'll continue in worship in a moment. Good morning, everybody. It's good. You guys are loud. Goodness. Yeah. I thought there was like 300 people in here. Um, good morning. My name is Nate Wagner. I'm one of the pastors here today, and it's so good to see you guys. We are continuing in our series on James, and um, James is a very practical manual for how to live the Christian life. And so, um, the first chapter is kind of like this broad introduction, and so it's not that much different from other places in the Bible, especially the New Testament, but it might have been a little bit different, but now it gets like super specific and super practical, and it is going to feel a little bit disorienting, um, and so, yeah, it's fun, or not, I don't know. Um, just be glad that you only have to hear about it for like 30 minutes this morning. I had to hear about it all week. Um, so we are going to be in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. I'm just going to go ahead and read this, and then we'll pray. James 2, 1 through 13. 
My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you have been called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, it is a stark picture. It's hard to fathom your people treating people like this, making evil judgments. And yet, Lord, we we know that we're not above that. We know that we probably do this all the time. And so, God, we need your word just as we remember back to last week when we receive it in meekness by hearing it and doing it and persevering in it. Lord, we need to be reminded of that. We need to be shown the intentions of our hearts. We need to be um, convicted of the areas of our lives where we are living as if we are our own gods. So Lord, help us do that. And help us to also receive the blessing of your son this morning as you offer us, offer him to us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you guys want to do elementary school again or middle school again? You, you want to do over? I don't know. It might go worse. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of terrifies me. When you think about it from like the perspective of an adult and you like think about what actually happens in the classrooms and on the playground and the lunchroom, it's terrifying. It's where probably maybe in the first really powerful way, most kids learn the way of the world and that there is a way of the world. Maybe they also learn that at home, but in Christian homes, if they are going into you know, a community of other kids, there's going to be a different way that things work. And it's just kind of natural to us. It comes very naturally to all of us, this way of the world. It's the world of haves and have-nots, eat or be eaten, the pretty and the ugly, the popular and the unpopular the good at dodgeball and the not good at dodgeball. (laughs) And I think all of us probably have had that experience of being excluded, of being the one who's chosen last, of being the one who doesn't have a date to the dance, of being the one who is trying to fit into a bunch of people who don't honor them and just kind of dismiss them. And that creates wounds, it creates dysfunction, it creates a chip on our shoulder. And so I think there's kind of like two different ways that people a lot of times, and everybody does both, so it's not just like two types of people in the world, but like there's two ways that everybody responds to these situations. One is by saying, you know what, I'm going to be the popular person so that I can exclude them. 
I'm going to work at it, and I'm going to get better. Or I'm going to make so much money that they are going to be poor in comparison to me. Or I am going to work out so much that I look beautiful compared to them. So that's one way. It's kind of like beat them at their own game. But another way that we respond to it in our human hearts is to become extremely bitter. And to just say, you know what? Those are the evil people. They are the ones who are mean. And so you're kind of like the mean girl to the mean girls. Or you're the bully to the bullies. And I think like if we just are honest with ourselves for a moment, we probably appreciate that one a little bit more. We're like, oh yeah, I could see, that's good, right? Um, there's like several movies that I'm, I'm recalling from my youth. Boondock Saints is one of them. If you guys have seen that, it's kind of like the bad guys for the bad guys. And they target the bad guys. Um, and something, something about that is kind of like interesting to us. But it just kind of recapitulates or retells that same story. It's of like a human way of treating other people. And it doesn't actually move anything up the field. It just continues to perpetuate the cycle. And so this morning, we're looking at a text that shows us how Jesus transforms how we treat people. And it's only Jesus who actually transforms how we treat people. And we're given um, a picture that is kind of heartbreaking. I mean, if you slow down and meditate on it and think about it, it's really heartbreaking. And it kind of cuts us to the core. And then we see how there's a new law or a interjection from heaven into the human wickedness that reestablishes, here's actually how you must treat people. And it's called the royal law. And yet, we'll see how far short we fall in implementing the royal law. And then we're going to see how Jesus is actually the one who transforms how we treat people. So first, we're going to look at how the world treats people and how that gets imported into a church. And it's hard to know if this is actually like a real-life scenario, if this is something that James actually has experience with. It's very specific, so I have a hunch that it might be, but it also could be just something hypothetical that he's like distributing to a bunch of churches because he knows that this is something that is a hu universal human struggle. And so he gives us this picture that there's two people that come into a gathering of Christians. And again, if you remember, this is the early, really, really, really early young church. And so the word is actually synagogue. So it's kind of like a synagogue that has been repurposed for Christian worship. And so they still have some of the um, rituals that were common in synagogues where there was seats and places of honor and then seats and places of kind of like for the lowly people. And so James gives us this, this example, and he says that the, the rich person, the well-dressed person, the externally impressive person comes in, and he is put into the position of honor. And it's a plural pronoun, so it's like the whole church doing it. And so he comes in, and he's given the seat of honor. It doesn't really sound like he knows this congregation that well. So he might be like a new person or someone who's relatively new to their community. And he comes in, and he's esteemed as honorable just because of his external appearance, because of his apparent wealth. And then you have this other, this other character who comes in, and he's in rags. And <laughs> smelly, odious, dirty garments. And he belongs at the feet, the place of dishonor, the place of filth. It's like, yeah, we'll let you in. You can stay, but you have to be down there. You have to be kind of dismissed out of the way. And so I want to I ask you guys, how does it feel to be those people? How does it feel to be the rich person? I mean, that's kind of the, the question that I had to get myself to ask. It wasn't the natural question for me, but I think it's an important one. How does it feel to be the rich person who walks in and has a bunch of people honoring them just for what's on the outside, 
for their possessions, for their looks, for their charm. Might feel pretty good initially. Be like, yeah, I deserve this. This is good. This is how the world should treat me. But if you're doing that all the time, it's kind of like the problem of the American celebrity, right? It's like you never know when someone actually cares about you because everyone is just kind of flattering you and fawning over you. And so intimacy and meaningful relationships are just kind of not going to happen. There's a superficial honoring, but it's paper thin, and it tears at the slightest pressure. And so there's an isolation in and of itself and a division, right? What just happened, as James says, is that you have made distinctions among yourselves. You've created a case. Now all of a sudden there's two different categories within the one people of God. And you are dividing what Christ unified. And it's wicked. And so it is, it's something that is isolating and disorienting even for the rich person. The person that we think of like, oh, he's, he's getting the good end of the stick here. Nobody is getting a good deal in this situation. And then you have the poor person. I was thinking about this. You know, if, you, if you're not around a lot of other people, you might forget that you're poor at times. You might forget that you smell. You might forget that, you're sh- that your dress is shabby. But then all of a sudden you walk into a church of people who are supposed to be missionaries for God, ambassadors for Christ. And they remind you in a split second no, you're, you're less than us. You're not as important as us. And not only that, but we're going to kind of move you to the side so we can actually focus our attention and our love and our care on this other person. And this is, again, it's the same thing, just pointed at a different person. You, you're getting isolation You're seeing the self-serving natural tendencies of the human heart getting expressed in relationships. Because the assumption here that James pulls out is that that person can't do anything for me. They're poor. They don't have anything for me. So, yeah, you can stay, but just stay out of the way. It's self-serving. It's manipulative, transactional. And this way of treating people leads to division, oppression, and ultimately minds that are enslaved to evil. You're making evil judgments. That becomes a muscle memory for an entire body. And in the end, it becomes a celebration of evil. The way of the world celebrates evil. And so James comes down fairly hard on that. He asks these rhetorical questions, essentially implying that you are worshiping, you are honoring a blasphemer. How can you claim to hold the faith of the Lord of glory when you worship and honor a blasphemer? And so he reminds them of this, what what he calls the royal law. In verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. So the royal law, if the way of the world is a celebration of evil, the royal law is a condemnation of evil. It presents another way. It presents a path of true love. Love that's sacrificial, that's selfless, that seeks to unify, that seeks to lift up. And this is getting to the heart of God, right? That's why he calls it the royal law. It belongs to the king. It belongs to the kingdom. It's an expression of God's heart and his character that we should love each other in this way. And specifically, James is going to bring them to the Sermon on the Mount, as kind of like the pinnacle of the teaching of the law, especially as Jesus redefines it and interprets the Ten Commandments in 
the Sermon on the Mount. And so he drops these two commandments in here. And they're kind of, like at first glance, you're like, why, is he, why does he use those? It seems kind of, you know, that escalated quickly. Partiality to murder. Like, wow. And that's why it's important to remember the context of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you're doing well, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all because he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. And so do you remember what Jesus said about adultery and what he said about murder? He said, you've heard that it has been said to you, do not commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever looks at a person with lustful intent has committed adultery. He's getting to the heart. He's cutting through the external, and he's going to your heart. You've heard that it, was, it is said, do not murder, but I say to you, anyone who is angry at their brother has already committed murder in his heart. The murder is the external expression but the sin resides in the human heart. We also see that the law demands perfect obedience. In order to fulfill the law of the king, you have to keep it perfectly because anyone who keeps all of it but the smallest portion of it, they don't keep. They are counted as a transgressor of the entire system. The full condemnation of the law comes crashing down on them, on us, when we fail to keep it. So there can be no self-serving, superficial obedience to this law. And the person who transgresses even the smallest portion of it is shown to be a transgressor. So this is where, okay, we, we now have to talk about something that is very common in our society. I, it like came to my mind, one of the first things. And that is how our society increasingly is starting to celebrate lifting up the oppressed, right? And that's probably a good thing. Not probably, it is a good thing. But you know what's not good is the heart with which that's being done. Because the heart is basically deputizing the law of Jesus to whatever is the trending social cause. And so, functionally, they are reigning as the Lord. So if you are treating someone, so let's just say, use the same example, and I can see this happening for us, and I think I am tempted in this way, and I think we all are to some degree. If you have the poor person and the rich person come over, I think a lot of us might be tempted to show partiality to the poor person. But not because we care about them. Instead, it's because we want to be seen as the type of person who cares about them. And the law, the royal law, will have none of that. Jesus is not your deputy. He's the Lord. And so the royal law condemns all evil, and that includes the evil in our hearts, the evil, the evil that we bring, even in our attempts to do good things, we have this residual evil. We have these desires that are self-serving, that are dismissive of other people. And so we need transformation. And this is the, the royal law, the function, especially in this passage, it functions in this beautiful way because what it does is it completely levels the playing field. It says, you church that's treating people this way, you are the poor person. You people who are looking down your noses at the people who are treating that person that way, you are the poor person. Because it's exposing us and our only hope is that Jesus, who in verse 1, he says, is the Lord of glory, transforms how the royal law functions. Because otherwise, we are transgressors, and we're condemned along with the most wicked. 
So our only hope is that the Lord of glory is going to transform us. And here's how that happens. We, when, when James uses the Lord of glory, he's kind of evoking this image of the Shekinah, what's called the Shekinah glory. It's the glory cloud. It's the presence of God that is described in the Old Testament different ways, smoke or mist or cloud. And it follows the presence of God. And so by invoking this name for Jesus, which is weird, it's out of nowhere, and it's just kind of tacked on at the end, he is essentially saying, come on into the presence of God, the Lord of glory. Moses tried that, and he was terrified, but then he was terrifying to the Israelites who saw just the reflection of that glory. It's pure. It discerns you down to the slightest intention of your heart and sees everything and exposes it for what it is. How ridiculous does this become in that context? You're going to stand in the temple of the Lord of glory and you're going to treat people like this? You're going to do anything but beg for mercy. And that's how Jesus transforms us. Is he, he says, no, you are that poor person standing in my presence. Even your best works, the best things you've ever done in your life are filth. They smell. And what does Jesus do? He embraces us. He puts on our filthy rags and gives us a new garment. He takes on human nature to walk in a way that we could not walk, to fulfill the royal law, and takes the condemnation that the royal law brings down on every single transgressor, and he destroys it in his own body on the cross. And in that moment, the royal law for all those who know Jesus and trust in him is transformed to the law of liberty, the law of freedom. The law of love is no longer something that we must do to fulfill the commandment, but it's something we get to do to reflect the glory of God in the mercy of Christ. And that's what Paul mean, or James means in the end here. He says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. That transformation's happened. He's assumed it. He's assumed that these are Christians who believe that. And so he's reminding them of that. The royal law for you has become the law of liberty. And it's become the law of liberty in this way. It is judgment with mercy. That's why there's freedom in it. But they are judging without mercy. And he says, if you judge without mercy, you can expect no mercy. That seems to kind of like undermine everything I just said in some ways. And it's the logic of Jesus. Jesus does this. And it's because he is, he is so acutely aware of what his work implies. It's not just like something that happened a long time ago and then everything kept going in the same trajectory. This was a seismic shift in the ordering of the universe, of the cosmos. When Jesus died, for all of his people, the gravitational center of the world was no longer them. And what I mean by that is that their lives no longer revolved around them that event pulls them into him. He is a gravitational center. And so when you have experienced mercy this way, that is now what you orbit around. And I think it's a, it's a fun image to think about because in an orbit, there are times where you get a little bit further away, but then you get pulled back in. Because none of us is perfect in being merciful all the time, of course. But like gravity, if we pretend like mer that mercy is not the center of our lives, 
it's going to hurt. Like beginner snowboarder hurt. If you've never been snowboarding for the first time, here's what's going to happen. You'll probably go down a steeper hill than you're ready for. And for a minute, you're going to be going really fast down the hill. And you might even think, oh, I got the hang of this. But then you'll catch an edge, and it's going to hurt. And that's what happens to God's people. When we forget that the center of our universe revolves around this picture of perfect, righteous mercy of Jesus on the cross, it hurts. It wounds our conscience. And so James is saying, you can't do that because it's not, it doesn't follow the laws of physics. The new laws of physics that faith in Christ demands is that you will always be brought back to mercy, that you'll be a people of mercy. And that's how Jesus is transforming how we treat people. And so now the picture that we can, <laughs> yay, <laughs> the picture the picture that we are given, that we can think about, that we can enjoy, is that the church of God becomes a mirror for the mercy of God. And that is extended to everybody, rich or poor, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of social standing, regardless of physical ability, regardless of age. We are a reflection of mercy. We are an invitation into the Lord of glory's presence, where he's merciful to us. And that, that is our freedom, is that we get to do that, that we get to hold out mercy in that way. And it's a beautiful thing, it's a wonderful thing, something worth living for, something worth constantly going back to and remembering, oh, my life doesn't revolve around me anymore. I don't really have an option to not be merciful. I don't really have an option to use that person as a pawn in my social media platform because I know the Lord of glory and he's been merciful to me. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that, um, that we get to see this, that we get to be reminded of this, this picture of your mercy it's hard to fathom. It's hard to, it's hard to really believe sometimes, God. And that is why you haven't done it in secret. You've done it in history. And you have given us your word to constantly bring us back to our crucified king, our risen Lord. And so, God, we need you to continue to be with us to make us more merciful. Help us to do that not for public approval, but for your approval, for your joy. And God, we thank you that you help us do that with your spirit, the spirit of your son, whom you give to us. God, we thank you that, that this church loves this picture, that we want to be a place that reflects your goodness, your mercy to everybody. And so, Lord, help us to live accordingly, that we would speak and act in alignment with that desire. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue uh, in worship with our offering. Uh, and just encourage you kind of in the same vein. Um, one of the ways we make <coughs> excuse me, distinctions with people is by what they have, right? And one of the ways that we um, sort of deceive ourselves or our heart is deceived uh, is that we are the ones that have acquired all of those things that we have. Uh, so a good check for that is to live according to how God's called us to live with our resources, right? To be merciful to others because at the end of the day, uh, every good thing we have comes from God and we're actually poor in and of ourselves without him. So we're in need and God provides. So that's the motivation we're able to use to give, to worship God, to give back to, to him everything he's given to us and to care for our brothers and sisters around us rather than creating distinctions of have and have not, rich and poor, etc. Uh, so the call and the encouragement is to give and to be generous because God has been generous to us. 
So if you haven't done that, or maybe that's tricky for you, obey, do it today. Uh, you can give, and there's lots of financial ways to give here, so there's a give box on your way out, there's ways to give online, but there's also uh, ways to serve and give of your time here. Maybe that's more difficult, maybe that's something you haven't done. Um, so consider that, church. Are we being obedient in that way? Are we worshiping God in that way? Or are we just kind of going through the motions of that? Because we want to be a church that gives in a way that actually does worship and exalt God. So let's do that. Um, we're going to continue now in communion as Pastor Nate leads us. Communion is really a beautiful picture of what it looks like for us to all be on that level playing field. We come with nothing in our hands. We all remember that we come to this table with our own filth, with our own good works that are revealed to be filthy, that are revealed to be nothing but rags. And we come, and maybe we come because we're attracted to that kingdom. We're like, I want to live in that kingdom. But when you come to this table, you don't get the kingdom, you get the king. And you get him in this way is that he clothes you with his righteousness. And he makes you new. And by coming and enjoying communion, is, it's a remembering of that. It's an experience of that. It's an encouragement in that to keep walking, to go and be merciful, to love mercy, and to do justice. And so for all of you who are trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and for newness of life, this is your table. And to you, he says, this bread is my body which is given for you. And this juice is the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you. It's my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Come and eat and come and drink. And if that's not you yet, this, this act is empty apart from faith. It's empty apart from trusting Jesus for those things and believing in him. And so we would ask that you would first take him, that you would believe him, that you would trust him, talk to somebody about that, work that out with somebody, and then come and celebrate, but wait to do it until you're there. So when you're ready, you can come down the center aisle and then take the elements and return to your seats along the sides.
a ruckus time. <laughs> I started that. <laughs>
merciful, merciful and mighty. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Amen. Church, please bow your heads and receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And all God's people said, amen. I have a few announcements for you. Hang on real quick. First, a reminder, the last Thursday of every month is Abide. So it's just a time and a space to pray. That one, the next one's coming up February 24th, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. here. You can come for the whole time, come for a part of the time, bring your kids, whatever. Please join us to pray. Second, send off celebration for the Connors is this coming Saturday, February 26th. It'll be here from 11 to 1. Food is provided, so just bring yourself and your family uh, and come ready to celebrate. Uh, and then a reminder that our next uh, round of foundations is coming up. So if you're new or if you want to become a member, it's kind of for both of those categories of people, uh, it's an introduction to the community, the theology, and the values of Portico. So it's going to be every Sunday in March from 1230 to 2 lunch included in the fellowship hall. So please join us for that and register for it. And then lastly, if you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. You can fill out a connect card or scan the QR code with your phone, or you can talk to our hospitality team there in the doorway there. They have a gift for you if you're new. So please make sure you get that. Have a lovely Sunday. We love you guys. We'll see you next week. You're dismissed.